Okay, this lecture is going to walk you through meiosis. Here are the outcomes. We will come back to those at the end of the lecture. So let's first talk about the purpose of meiosis. So the purpose is to create gametes. In humans, gametes are your egg and sperm. And what's important about gametes is that they have half the genetic information of the original cell Right? So this is a 2n cell, 2n equals 4, and these are all haploid, n equals 2. So I want you to see they have one of each chromosome from a homologous pair. So they all have a blue one, and they all have a red one. The other important part of meiosis is you might see are these chromosomes have little bits and pieces of other chromosomes. So you're also making genetically different gametes. So I want you to look at just the colors and you can see they're all slightly different. And that's due to a process of crossing over which we'll talk about in a minute. So you are making four haploid cells from one diploid cell. So it's one diploid to four haploid. They're all genetically different and they are going to be the cells that go on for sexual reproduction. And sexual reproduction means you're taking genetic material from two sources and combining it into a new offspring. So we'll talk about that at the end as well. A big difference between meiosis and mitosis is that there are two phases, or there's two, I should say, let me say this again, two rounds of cell division. Right? Mitosis just has one round. What's similar is there's only one round of DNA replication. So they both replicate DNA once, but meiosis is going to divide twice. This is called reduction division because you're reducing <clears throat> the number of chromosomes. Okay. Again, here's our homologous pair, one from mom, one from dad, a maternal and a paternal. And you undergo S phase, and you have your homologous pairs that are replicated. And then what's going to happen in the first separation is you separate homologous pairs. This is different. This never happens in mitosis. In the second round of cell division, you separate the sisters. This is just like mitosis. So, something you want to think about are similarities and different similarities, yeah, and differences between meiosis and mitosis. Okay. So let's look at what's really interesting and allows for genetic diversity. And that happens in prophase one. So you're going to see, let me just give you a preview, that we talk about meiosis one and meiosis two. And they go, both go through PMAT. So we have to differentiate the first set of cell divisions from the second. So in prophase one, we know that in prophase, chromosomes condense so that we can see them, just like in mitosis. <clears throat> but what's different in prophase one is you have something called crossing over. And I'm going to show you a better picture in just a minute. But what it means, crossing over, 
allows for genetic exchange between homologous chromosomes. Okay, so a genetic exchange between the mom and dad or the maternal and paternal chromosomes. This is very unique to meiosis. Happens in prophase one. And what you can barely see, but you can see it a little better here, is the tips of some of these chromosomes are different because they have exchanged genetic material. So let's look at this a little bit more. So here we have an homologous pair. And we have our sisters, which are identical. Sisters one, we'll call it, or we'll call it, instead of getting confused with one and two, we'll call it sisters A and sisters B. Okay. Crossing over happens between homologous chromosomes, not between sister chromatids. Chromosomes not between sisters because sister chromatids are identical. So that wouldn't give you any genetic diversity. So crossing over is the key to genetic diversity. Right? So even though you may eventually turn into your mom or dad, trust me, it happens. you won't be exactly like them. Okay, so we have a homologous pair, an orange and a yellow crossing over. And what they do is they actually, chromosomes break and rejoin and you exchange genetic information. And this can happen on all over and on both um, of the homologous chromosomes, so you see they didn't draw it, but the red and green ones exchanged. Okay. And we'll talk about this as far as um, genetics. Uh, let me give you a couple more terms on this slide. Um, so when you pair up this homologous pair, this is also called a tetrad not tetrado, but just a tetrad, which means four, or bivalent, which means these two um, sister chromatids are coming together in their homologous pairs. So these terms basically mean the same thing, just describes homologous pairs lining up. or crossing over. Okay. Um, mother term. Synapsis. Synapsis and crossing over mean the same thing. The physical structure where synapsis happens is called the chiasma or chiasmata is plural. So let me change color so you can see. So chiasma is the physical structure where synapsis or crossing over happens. Now there is a little bit uh, high level detail, but I don't think you'll even learn that in um, genetics. So for you, chiasmata is the plural of chiasma. Physical structure where crossing over happens. So this would be a chiasma, this would be a chiasma. 
Okay, this is showing crossing over or synapsis, and this is your end result. Okay, remember this is all happening in prophase one. Okay, so let's look at the steps of meiosis. So we start with G1, S, G2. And you know S happened because your chromosomes are in Xs. And this tells you 2N equals 4. So you have four chromosomes, two pairs. This diagram is not good at showing crossing over. So right here, crossing over is happening. Okay. And then the chromosomes line up in the middle, metaphase. The difference here is that the pairs line up. This is very different than mitosis. We don't have this happening in mitosis. And so the pairs line up and you make the spindle fibers and then you separate the pairs in anaphase. So, PMAT is the same general um, properties. You just have to look at how the chromosomes are lining up in metaphase. Okay. So, anaphase, you separate the pairs. Telophase, again, you um, start making the nuclei. The chromosomes decondense. We never show them decondensed because we're kind of trying to keep track of them. You have cytokinesis, and so now you have two cells you undergo a little bit more growth, but not the whole G1, S, G2, and now you're at prophase two, where your chromosomes are condensing again, the nuclear envelope is breaking apart, and now in metaphase, you line up the chromosomes just like you did in mitosis, and you split the sisters. So meiosis 2 looks very much like mitosis, except that you're following two cells instead of one, and you're going to result in four haploid cells after telophase 2 and cytokinesis. So again, what's important is you have one round of DNA replication, and don't worry, we're going to draw this all, and two rounds of cell division. The other big key is to note that the pairs line up and you separate the pairs in meiosis 1 unique to meiosis. Okay, so let's draw this. And this is going to take a little while because of all of the uh, pen switching. This is where you really need four different colors. So I'm going to do my red. and my blue, and I'm just going to cross over the tips. Now it can happen all over the place, but let's not go crazy here. Keep it simple, students. And I have an orange one. Okay, so I'm showing crossing over right now. And yes, I always have a tendency to already line them up in the middle, so let's just um, copy this to metaphase, but what I'm going to show you is that now my chromosomes have exchanged a little genetic information. So I have some green tips on my orange and some orange tips on my green.
and some red on my blue, oops, and some blue on my red. And I only do it at the tips and I only do it between uh, one of the homologous, or I guess I should say one of the sisters from each to keep it simple. You get the point. You don't spend your whole life drawing all of this. Okay, so don't forget we have spindle fibers that are connecting. And now you're separating the pairs. So you're pulling the X's apart from each other, but you're not separating the X itself. And after you've been doing this for years, kind of know where to draw everything, kind of. Oops. It's, ah! Green chips. And orange. Okay, didn't quite match up to my spindle fibers. All right, so we have separated the pairs. All right, to make life a little simpler, right? This is what's gonna happen in Tila phase. Right? We're gonna separate, you're gonna put them in here, you're gonna put them in prophase, and then we're gonna line them up in metaphase. So I'm going to draw them in telophase so you can see how we've now created two different cells. Oops. <laughs> I didn't quite make these guys line up. So this down the middle is just showing you cell division, cytokinesis. I know cytokinesis happens after telophase. I'm just trying to illustrate for you what's happening. Okay. So we're just going to write continue, right? So prophase, you've got the same chromosomes. Metaphase now, what's important is that you're lining up the chromosomes just like you did in mitosis. Okay. So metaphase, where I'm going to line up my chromosomes. So I have a little bit of green and a big green. And you can line it up. Either way, I just know that we're dividing it oops, into cells kind of in a vertical fashion. Let's see if I, my brain did this right. Okay, that is ugly chromosome. And then I need my red, so I've got red, and it doesn't matter, honestly, which side you put the recombinant and the one that didn't exchange genetic information. And we'll talk about this in, oops, genetics. Okay, so I've lined them up. Now let's draw our spindle fibers because what we're going to do now is just like we did in mitosis, we're going to split the sisters. Right? So we're splitting the X. And so what that's going to look like, we'll draw one more time, is we've got a red 
we've got partial red, and we've got red with little pieces. And we've got, this one has blue tips. And over here, I've got a blue over here and a partial blue here. And green, and you can draw them any way you want as far as the curves on them. Tips of green, red, blue, orange. Orange, orange, orange. So, what I did was I just split down the middle. Right? Okay, so my spindle fibers were pulling these guys apart. And they result in four unique, excuse me, haploid cells. So we've got a red chromosome, a part of a red chromosome, and tips. And I highly suggest you draw this out at least a couple times, because you're going to have to draw part of it on your exam. Orange, partial orange, tips of orange, green, green, tips of green. So let's see. We've got our red with blue and our orange, and our orange with green and our blue, and our green and our red with blue tips, and our red and our green with orange tips. So after cytokinesis, you have four haploid, right, because they only have half of the genetic information compared to the first one. This was diploid. Right. And they're genetically different. So right now, all you know is that means different colors. We will assign alleles to these when we talk about genetics. Okay, so lots to keep track of. I like this image because it is lining up prophase 1 and prophase 2 and meta 1 and meta 2 and ana. So you can see that the same things are happening. The key is how you're lining up the chromosomes in metaphase. And the key is in prophase 1, you have crossing over, but you don't have it again. Okay, another way you can draw this a little more simple, and it still shows you know what's happening. Oh goodness, all right, let's draw our cell, and let's draw our chromosomes, and yes, I'm going to cross them over and line them up all together. This I think is the easiest way to kind of remember what's going on. I didn't draw my orange tips long enough. Okay. So I have a cell, 2n equals 4. I've got four chromosomes. I've got my homologous pairs lined up. I've got them crossing over. So let's draw what happens after you start to separate them. Okay. Same thing we drew before. We're just making it a little more simple and easy on the eyes. Okay, and then what you can do is you can just do this. 
that is what happens at the end of meiosis one. Right? You have now two cells with their sisters still hooked together. And then you draw one more split. And this is the split for meiosis two. All right? And you would end up with one, two, three, four, and you just draw what you see on either side of the split line. Right? So I have a red one, and on this one I have half a red, and in the next cell I have red edges. Right? So I'm just going down, following down along these, and if it makes sense to you better, you can just draw one at a time. Again, I've been doing this for a while. Green green chips. And there's no orange in this first one. The next one has orange tips. It's half orange. It's this. Okay? So you end up with four genetically non-identical haploid cells. So if you line them up right, you can draw a line and split and split, and that will give you your end result. Okay. What I will ask you to do is I will ask you to draw specific phases of meiosis given a specific number of uh, chromosomes. All right, so let's take a minute and do a couple clickers. Well, not clickers, but test yourself. So meiosis II typically produces blank cells, each of which is blank. So hopefully you come up with the answer. Four cells genetically non-identical. Synapsis occurs when? During prophase of meiosis one. Okay. For a cell, 2n equals 4, which figure shows metaphase of mitosis? Go take a look. And hopefully you picked D. So you have four chromosomes because 2n equals 4, and in mitosis we split the sisters. I can't spell sisters. Right? So this is mitosis. For a cell with 2n equals 4, which shows metaphase of meiosis 1. Okay. So you should pick answer A because you're lining up homologous pairs. And you still have one, two, three, four chromosomes. Can you imagine what the last question is? Which is met metaphase for mitosis? A uh, mitosis two. Meiosis two. And that is B, because again, you have half the number of chromosomes originally because you've done one split. Okay, I may only show you one cell. So if I say 2n equals 4, the way you know this is meiosis 2 versus mitosis is it has half the amount of the chromosomes. Okay. So don't get fooled if I just show you one cell and say, oh, well, it must be mitosis because there would be two cells. I'm of course going to test your brain. Wait. So 2n equals 4, you're going to have four chromosomes in mitosis. 2n equals 4, you're going to have two chromosomes, four chromatids, in meiosis 2. I really like this image because it helps you see the difference between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Okay, 
separating the homologous pairs. versus separate the sisters. Okay. So, what's happening is we produce haploid, egg and sperm, N and N, and when they fertilize, you get a 2N zygote. That was you, many years ago. And you divided by mitosis, 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 and became the beautiful person that you are. And in your ovaries or your testes, whichever you may have, you have had some cells undergo meiosis to produce the egg or the sperm. Okay. Fertilization is the key to sexual reproduction. What I want you to see is that you have four distinct chromosomes from, say, mom, that compare with four distinct chromosomes, or how do I want to say this? You have four distinct chromosomes that can make up these different eggs, right? And then dad's sperm is going to also have distinct chromosomes due to crossing over. And whichever one gets fertilized, that becomes you, right? And a different egg with a different sperm becomes fertilized, and that becomes your brother or your sister. Okay. So nobody is identical, unless you have an identical twin, because every single gamete is unique based on how the crossing over happened. Now, sometimes things don't go as perfect as we would want, and I want to introduce you to one more concept, and that's called non-disjunction. Non-disjunction means your chromosomes don't separate properly. And we're really mostly interested in non-disjunction in um, gamete production because this affects the next generation. So you can have non-disjunction in meiosis 1, so let's just look at this left half, right, where somehow the, maybe the spindle fiber didn't connect. And so you get too many chromosomes during your first cell division, and that leaves you with gametes with extra or a loss of chromosomes. Remember, gametes are just sitting there until they get fertilized. You can have non-disjunction in meiosis 2, where again you make some normal haploid gametes, but you also make some with extra or less chromosomes. And so what does that mean for the next generation? Well, if you took, say, an egg with N plus 1 and fertilized it with a sperm that was normal N, Okay. Let's put these together. Your zygote is going to have, in this case, two small chromosomes, but three large ones. And remember, this is called trisomy. If you took an egg, say, with N minus 1, and this could happen with egg or sperm, and you fertilized it with a normal sperm, your offspring, oops, too close to the edge, your offspring would have two little chromosomes and only one large one, and this is called monosomy, where you have one less chromosome. So when you take genetics, you learn to um, look at all these possibilities for producing offspring. We won't go there. I want you to understand this concept of non-disjunction that can result in the change in chromosome number that can result in aneuploidy. So remember, aneuploidy is when you have a different than the standard number of chromosomes. This last chart is just FYI, and I want you to see that humans can't really tolerate monosomy or trisomy very well. 
So there are only three chromosomes that produce live births, um, autosomal chromosomes with trisomy. So trisomy 21, very common, Down syndrome. Trisomy 18 is Edwards syndrome, and trisomy 13 is Patau. Sex chromosomes we handle a little bit better. You can have a couple X's, you can have a triple X, you can have a couple Y's. Turner syndrome is when someone has an X, one X chromosome, and no second X chromosome, and no Y. So we put a zero as a place marker to say, no, we're not forgetting to write something, they just only have one X. This is the only viable monosomy in humans. So you can live with one X and no Y, but you cannot live with just a Y and you cannot live with just one of any of the other autosomal chromosomes. And one of the reasons that trisomy 21 um, and some of these other trisomies are um, seen more often in older moms is because in females, females are born with all their eggs. and their eggs are sitting at metaphase one. So crossing over has happened and they're all just sitting there lined up, right? Oops, let me not draw this incorrectly. Oh, I don't know why I'm writing that. Oh, oh. Right, they're sitting there for years and years and years until ovulation. And so there's a good chance that spindle fibers can break down over time. And that can lead to trisomy 21. So that can lead to non-disjunction, which can lead to an aneuploidy. And so I think I think it's like 35 now. They consider you a high risk pregnancy where they will, will ask you if you want to be screened um, for any of these uh, chromosomal conditions um, just because statistically um, there's a higher chance that non disjunction is happening in older women. Men continuously produce new sperm, so they're not hanging around um, kind of getting old. All right, so I've made a list for you of some really good animations to help you look at mitosis and meiosis and the differences between the two. Let's make sure we've covered all our outcomes. So we know the purpose of meiosis is to make four haploid genetically unique cells. These go together. You have to have meiosis one followed by meiosis two Make sure you know the events, right? Pairing up the homologous chromosomes versus splitting the sisters. I think these are two. Okay. Be able to recognize those stages from diagrams. Um, we've talked about bivalent and tetrads. That's just when your homologous pairs come together. Crossing over, chiasma, synapsis. Right, that's where we're getting some genetic exchange. Genetic exchange or crossing over is how genetic variation is happening. And fertilization, the genetic variation we'll see in a Punnett square is because any egg has the potential to be fertilized by any sperm. So you can get any combination um, of alleles in your gametes. Errors in meiosis is non-disjunction. Aneuploidy means you have a different number of chromosomes than the wild type. And gosh, be able to compare and contrast mitosis and meiosis. That sounds like a good quiz question to me. All right, I hope this helped. Draw, 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 practice, watch videos, ask questions. Bye.